Sometimes photons would pass through a medium completely unscathed, yet the rubidium atoms, which, is, which it's passing through, would still become excited, and for just as long if they had absorbed the photons. So again, the photons did not get absorbed by the medium and did not seem to interact with the medium, but the medium still got excited, which is very weird. And even stranger still, when photons were absorbed, they would seem to be re-emitted almost instantly, well before the rubidium atoms returned to their ground state, as if the photons, on average, were leaving the atoms much quicker than expected. And they worked on a theoretical framework for all of this and studied it, and at the end of the day they came up with the conclusion that, bizarrely, the photons seem to be exiting the medium, at least some of them do, before they ever enter, enter it. Or at least the medium behaves that way, which is, I think, shocking and wild and shows how very little we understand truly about particle physics. Does this mean they've invented time travel? What the f Well, Tartaria was everywhere. And the history is fabricated, completely fabricated, all of it. We used to think, well, the Middle Ages, we really don't know what happened. We realize that they invented the Dark Ages, and they put it there to push a lot of things into the past. And we realized, you know, some parts of history could be wrong. But no, not everything is fabricated. Everything is fabricated. One interesting thing is the architecture that we find all over the world, in all our cities. That ancient Gothic-style architecture, incredibly intricate design, and people look at it and say, Oh, but that's just how they did things in the old days. Several of those buildings are simply stunning. The architecture of those buildings is absolutely enchanting. And think about it, if we lived in a feudal culture, if we lived in a culture where you had to go out and work to make a living and earn a wage in order to pay to stay alive, you never would have had the time or the inclination to build buildings that look like that and function the way they did. Said it before and I'll say it again, I think that we stumbled upon a lot of things that were already here before we were. Not so much like modern day buildings and things like that in cities. Uh, but like the pyramids and whatnot, like I do think there were a lot of things here before we got here. I do think we took a lot of inspiration from these previous civilizations that were here before us, previous technology, secrets, knowledge, things that we've found uh, over the years. But this Tartaria stuff, man, it's super interesting. I love it. It's <laughs> kind of wild and creepy at the same time. Being from Chicago, watching a lot of this stuff really made me rethink the Chicago fire. As if, like, maybe they burnt down the city of Chicago to hide a lot of the old architecture and secrets and basically evidence of a more intelligent civilization. And then just rebuilt a new city on top of it. It just, it just kind of makes you look at all these other <laughs> things, similar things that happen across the world, you know, just tearing down old stuff and building new stuff on top of it. Not necessarily just to progress you know, the, the city and update buildings and stuff like that, but for, like, a more nefarious reason. And if this is your first time here, make sure you give the video a like and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this. We do them all the time. April 6, 1989. And that's when Gene and me and Bob, Bob's wife and his wife's sister, we drove in. We had in the back Geiger counters, film, cameras, videos, everything. And as we drove down Groom Lake Road at that time, we thought that the legal cutoff was that road that comes down from mailbox road and so when we got there i said look let's just stay here and you know even if we get a mile closer it's not going to make that much difference in the film and they said no no let's go on so we went another couple hundred feet and we had the lights out we as we stopped a couple sets of headlights came on in front of the vehicle and we decided to run because i thought we were in illegal territory as it turns out we weren't and we could have all avoided a lot of trouble and bob never would have lost his job and i never would have lost mine if we'd have just you know sat there and let him walk up to us but the fact is uh we thought we were in illegal territory we turned around we started going 90 miles an hour down the road with them in hot pursuit uh, we almost made it to the highway, but they had sent another Bronco around and cut us off. And when we saw him coming down the road, we stopped. Bob ran out in the desert. I jumped out and started setting up the telescope, and that's when the first Bronco came to a halt. And I ran up and threw my hands against the, the uh, top of the car, and I said, you know, holy smokes, you guys aren't dopers, are you? You scared the hell out of us out here. And they get out and they all uh, were armed with machine guns and they stand around, there was like four or five of them and they stood at port arms around us. 
And the one guy said, what are you guys doing up here? And he said, oh, we're just looking at the stars. He said, well, why did you run? And I said, like I said, we thought you were dopers. And he said, well, we're not. We need to see some identification. And <clears throat> we showed him some, uh, we had to uh, give him our social security and, and the driver's license. And he ran it. And all this process took about 30 minutes. And he said, we can't kick you off the range here because this is BLM land. He said, uh, but we'll make it awful uncomfortable if you stay here. So they turned around and left. We stood behind the car waiting for about 15 minutes and then Bob comes out of the desert. And we start talking about all the stuff that we'd done, the, you know, the, the uh, three weeks before, the two weeks before, all the stuff that we had done that night, all the preparation and everything, not realizing that all the time they had just gone about maybe 100 meters down the road and were filming us in infrared and uh, listening to us with a, a parabolic microphone. Uh, all of which was readily made readily apparent to Bob the next day when he was taken up to security. So anyway, we packed up our stuff and went out on the road, and as we got to the highway, we were talking about the uh, Lincoln County Sheriff, Doug Lamoureux, who has since become a good friend. Um, and he kept us there for an hour. Uh, he wanted to see in the trunk, but we wouldn't let him in there, uh, mainly because that was where the gun was that Bob had taken out in the desert. But anyway, it seems that Lamoureux needed... No, uh, knew exactly what was going on. He wanted to know why there was five people in the vehicle now and only four on the test site, and he wanted to know where the gun was. So obviously there was communication between the security forces on the uh, test site and, and the sheriff. Anyway, we stood there for an hour. Nobody said anything. And um, finally, uh, to bring this all to um, uh, a halt, Bob decided to confess that it was his gun and it was in the trunk. And I saw him walking to go ahead and do it, and at that split second, Doug said, okay, look, here's what we're gonna do. I've been advised to release you guys, but we don't wanna ever see you here again, ever. And he let us go. And it was a real quiet ride home that night. And uh, the next day, Bob's boss, Dennis Mariana, uh, called him up and said, uh, Bob, I'm gonna pick you up. Uh, don't go to the airplane. I mean, don't go to the EGMG. He picked him up, he drove him up to Indian Springs, which is this site of the uh, uh, entire security for the test site. And they actually pulled him out of the car with a gun in his head, and a uh, gun in his ear, and um, said, Bob, when we gave you the security clearance and told you this was a secret, it didn't mean you could tell all your friends about the flying saucers. The first thing they said was, you know, when we trusted you with this information, we didn't mean you know, intend for you to tell everyone you know about it. <laughs> that Gardell's an M16 directly in my face and, uh, you know, wanted to impress upon me how serious they were about it. Really, man, hats off to Bob Lazar. I mean, he, I don't know if you are super familiar with the things that he went through uh, after releasing this information initially. I mean, now he has a Netflix documentary and he's really well known and people don't really pay attention anymore, I feel like, because like the story's so old. But he's one of the only people like in the main, I guess the mainstream whistleblower UFO community whose story hasn't changed in like 30 years. Like it's the same. He doesn't pretend to know everything like a lot of these people with these UFO experiences do, just releasing books and kind of adding more stuff to their story over time to keep it interesting or saying they were just lost memories. Like his story's been the same over the years. And then you have friends of his that are telling like the same story he is. So just gives a lot of credibility to it. And man, I mean, he was, he was drugged through hell. Good on him, man. We need more people like him. Two moons mean twice the power, twice the influence and potentially twice the chaos. This comes with many implications. Think about it. Lunar energy already plays a huge role in shaping our emotions, our behaviors, and even natural events like tides. Now, with the appearance of a second moon, we're stepping into uncharted territory. The energy from this event is expected to heighten emotional intensity, causing everything from sudden mood swings to erratic behaviors. This isn't just an internal shift. The world around us will feel it too. Technology could malfunction, communication may become more erratic, and even weather patterns might become unpredictable. But what's even more important is the spiritual significance. In many cultures, the moon represents balance and harmony. With two moons, that balance could be disrupted, forcing us to confront deeper, 
unresolved aspects of ourselves. Are you prepared for the emotional, spiritual, and even physical turbulence that's coming? Because each of us to the edge. So here's something really interesting. I'm not really into the spiritual, go to the beach, get in a drum circle, dance in the moon kind of energy enthusiast like culture that's really big here in Florida. It's, it's cool for people, but it's just not really been my thing. But I have to say, and I've talked to many people and I felt it myself, like this past like month, things feel weird, man. Like I feel like my mood has been like all over the place, uh, up and down. People have been acting strange. Life has been weird and difficult. And I know that the world is in a difficult place right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, a lot of it is not great <laughs> for a lot of people, but it does just feel weird, man. And if you are familiar with like the hollow moon theory, and basically it's a created object, right? And not like a natural object like other moons. And basically it came here to balance the Earth's gravity and rotation and the tides and, and whatnot to make the Earth function the way it does now. I could see another moon being within like that space and it kind of throwing things off and making things feel weird. So I don't know. I don't have a lot of information on it. Um, I just know that things have felt weird for me lately. Uh, a lot of people I know feel the same way. So let me know if you feel it too. Like I said, I'm, this isn't something I'm like, the moon is in Gatorade right now. So or Venus is in Costco or whatever people say to basically like not take accountability for them being assholes but it does feel weird <laughs> it feels strange things feel off so let me know in the comments if you feel it too but this is why the colors are in black and white and let me show you why so as somebody just said all of those are slaves yeah well that's the thing is these people are born into this they are from incubators they're probably clones you know there's lots of orphans and infants you know, this, it's really weird when you start to think about it. Like, think about all these, these buildings being there, but then all the people who are there are usually orphans or infants, and there's some sort of reproduction happening, because where did all the children come from? And we'll talk about that next. But there's an interesting part in here, and it talks about, you know, a lot of people say this is all paper mache. You know, they didn't use any real copper. They didn't use any real materials. It was all fake. That's actually, that's the story. But it caught on fire and it looks like stone to me. But this is why the colors are in black and white. And let me show you why. It says, crowning the central agriculture dome was the only statue at the fair by Augustus St. Gardens, who originally intended to make a statue by name Diana, which was 18 and a half feet of pure copper. This was a huge weather vane for the Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden, doesn't that sound familiar? We know that one. New York City, I think that's where it is, or wherever it is. It's New York or New Jersey, whatever it is. But it's a common name that we still hear to this day. And here, we're gonna see more angels on a ship. If you guys see all that. So this was all built, you know, just overnight, kind of. That's what they kind of told us. They prepared the people. And this statue is made out of gold. statue was moved it, it's still partially located in Chicago but they did move it but look at those arches this is remarkable I mean we can barely build a square box nowadays and this is what they were building in 1893 you know I mean just look at the detail I mean look at that and then you also have angels on top and then you got horses on top as well too it's plaster they tell us that's what people are commenting below this was all plaster you know, plaster, that's what they're saying. And look at all these lights. This doesn't look very uh, eco-friendly, or I may be against climate change, as we were told. Remember the whole climate change thing? Looks very, uh, it would affect the climate, as we are being told. But look at this. I mean, these are all the lights that are lit up at nighttime. And those are on gas and dynamos and everything related to this. So for me personally, the thing that bothers me the most and makes me the most upset, if all that stuff was real, like brick, mortar, copper steel however they made it if they ripped it down for whatever reason to hide the ancient civilization or the the older more advanced civilization that is the most upsetting thing to me i mean people travel to greece and people travel to italy and all over the world to see these types of buildings and monuments and structures and just this beautiful architecture if we had that here in the united states i know there's still some but if we had like that a lot of it like if that was like our main architecture and they tore it down for whatever reason, that is 
so upsetting to me. But also the Chicago World Fair that this, you know, Tartaria book or whatever is talking about this guy has, they actually had a moving walkway, which was insane. It was like in the airport, the moving walkway is like the uh, horizontal escalator, basically, that speeds up your walk from terminal to terminal. Like they had that there. There was like video of it. And it's crazy. I mean, the fact that they had, <laughs> you know, in the late 1800s when it's supposed to be like horse and buggies and little house on the prairie type stuff that they had all this, these things if they were able to make this kind of architecture with quote-unquote paper mache why don't they still make it like that why don't they make it like legit though because that was literally beautiful that like bridge and those arches like it looked like ancient rome or greece but like here in chicago i want to see that shit, dude Apollo 11. there is stanley kubrick and there is the apollo 11 logo on the camera here is stanley kubrick examined the first footprint of the man walking on the moon neil armstrong there is stanley kubrick and a set with an astronaut on wires here is stanley kubrick from the front there is another view of the set with a lunar model and operators in front of a huge moon model and an operator with camera artists who are painting the moonscape on huge canvas another view of the moon simulator and an operator in front of rails for a moving camera filming the models to simulate approaching the moon surface while the models were on the left and on the right side of the rails and the canvas was on the top here the camera is filming the top so the canvas on rails artists are painting the canvas and there is the canvas hanging from the top side so the moving camera on rails below this canvas can film this and this is what it looks like here is the moving camera on rails filming the canvas I'm just going to say it. I believe it. I believe it's real. I believe that we walked on the moon on Stanley Kubrick's movie set. 100%. Like, so some of this footage, I could see it nowadays being AI to kind of create like this um, trick us into thinking that, you know, Stanley Kubrick actually did that. I don't know if any of that footage is real. It's so hard to tell nowadays with AI being so advanced, but I've thought that for a long time. It, I think there's a good chance that footage is real. I mean, Stanley Kubrick, if you look at uh, video breakdowns of like people talking about him hinting in The Shining, like with a kid wearing like an Apollo 11 sweater and just all the hints throughout The Shining of him trying to basically tell us that he filmed the moon landing. Whether he was doing that just to stir up controversy or messing with us or actually like leaking, you know, the information that he worked on the Apollo 11 mission, who knows? But I personally think that we probably sent something to the moon, maybe not people, maybe just like a ship or something or, or a robot or something, and we found something up there that we could not share. And if we did go to the moon, I think we found something that we're not allowed to talk about or someone that told us not to tell the rest of us about it. Uh, so they had to record something to show us something different than what's actually there. Do you believe that uh, various presidents have been informed about what you believe to be the truth on UFOs? The people that control this information is a uh, organization that uh, we know of as MJ-12. And uh, they're a uh, top uh, uh, group of uh, military and scientists. And uh, I do know that when the president becomes president, it takes at least three or four months before he is, actually gets the clearance to know everything there is. Now that doesn't mean they tell him but it does take three or four months to get. The quote from uh, Carter when he was uh, during his election campaign, if I become president, I'll make every piece of information this country has about UFO sightings available to the public and the scientists. I am convinced that UFOs exist because I have seen one. Jimmy Carter says he saw one. That's Jimmy Carter, he saw one so, in 1973. But he didn't, he didn't tell us, did he? He doesn't, the pressure is enormous on these people to cover this stuff up. The Air Force has made a, an art form of uh, ridiculing people who have talked about this thing. They've done an excellent job of covering it up for the last 40 years. George, basically what we're dealing with here is, I'll give you the bottom line. Okay. I'm not trying to sell a, I want to hear your thesis. I'm You're not trying to point. sell a book. I'm not trying to promote a lecture. This is based on what I've come across after intense uh, research in the last year. And I have found out that the government has retrieved between 10 and 15 fl actual flying saucers, three of which have been in perfect condition, one of which they tried to fly. Uh, up at the test site, there is uh, uh, a report that uh, of the three that they got in perfectly good condition, at least one is up at the test site and has flown, and, and one was being flown as, as, as of 1981. By us? By us, yeah. 
There's not a doubt in my mind that we recovered spaceships. I don't know if they're from space or from hollow earth or from the bottom of the ocean. If they're time travelers, if they're interdimensional beings, if they're extraterrestrials from outer space, who knows? I, I don't know. But I 100% think that we have encountered these ships and these beings, right? These humanoid beings and all these things that these whistleblowers talk about. There's not a doubt in my mind, man. Our jump in technology since the mid 1900s of when they supposedly like recovered all these ships and stuff and they claim they didn't has has been like insane and i know technology just exponentially increases like that that's what happens especially now with like ai and things like that and we've had ai for a while much longer than they've told us i mean i feel like we would have to have something to refer to right something to kind of reverse engineer something to teach us or someone to teach us in order to have the exponential growth that we've had within just like technology and in our civilization i don't know you have to let me know what you think but i am 100 percent on board with <laughs> all these whistleblowers for the most part